living a life that is a clear testimony to the glory of God. And then when somebody asks you, how do you do it? You say, it's not me, but it's the hope of glory. It's Jesus in me. It's, it's the relationship I have with the Holy God through Jesus Christ, his son, and the Holy Spirit lives inside of me. Now people say, oh, I don't understand all that stuff. Just know that if you see something in me, it's not me. It's the God who lives in me. Well, good evening. Good evening. We are here, excited. School started today, so we're excited. We'll make a mention of that in our prayer time. Yeah, pra- this they they, oh, yeah. they run they run similar to Orange County, but they started today. Um, I never understood starting on a Thursday, but so I'm I'm in agreement with the school an extra day but we're excited to be here we're in um first peter Thank you. chapter three verse eight officially but unofficially verse seven <laughs> so we got to finish what we started last week and then get through today because i made an announcement on sunday morning that next week is going to be a very very uh important lesson because the latter part of this chapter um, talks about Christ's suffering and ours, and that's the overarching topic, but within that topic, there are three religious misnomers, mistakes, um, that have been drawn from this passage. One is the idea of purgatory. The other is universal salvation, which means everybody is saved. You don't need Jesus. Um, So purgatory, universal salvation, and then baptismal regeneration, which talks about the waters having some salvific power that by being baptized, you're saved. And the only way to be saved is through the baptismal waters. So, next week is a very, very interesting series and we will spend um, some time answering and correcting those misconceptions and showing you um, where they come from, showing you what it absolutely cannot mean and then giving you some insight as to what it can mean or what it does mean. And it's a little bit tricky. There's there's no question about it. These passages can be a little bit confusing, but I think if you walk out of here next week understanding these passages, I think it'll give you a, a clearer insight, almost as if you clean your sunglasses or clean your glasses you'll have a better vision for those of you that don't wear glasses then you'll just have a better concept of it i think these passages next week are super important so it's really really important that i get through these verses that i get through verse 17 today and we're starting in verse 7 so i think we can handle 10 11 verses I did two chapters on Sunday morning in Revelation, which, like, I was shocked when I walked out of there. I felt like I had gotten (laughs) squeezed. But we did it. So let's pray. Ask God to bless our time together. Uh, Please remember the Sturgill's in your prayers. Um, He was feeling a really depressed, Tom was, because he was sick. And when he went to get checked, it turned out he had pneumonia. Um, so it, it was limiting his ability to, to go anywhere so they couldn't travel um, and as you heard through the email at 10.20 uh, Sunday morning his brother John passed away um, so I don't know what their update is I know 
that he was going to want to get up there some way or another, but I haven't heard that they left or they went, but we'll be praying for them. So uh, let's pray. Father, we thank you for this night, and we thank you for this opportunity you give us to come and study your word. We pray that you would speak to us, Mm -hmm. that you would enlighten us, have us to know what it is you want us to know. Father, we thank you for this precious time, and we pray that you would speak to us through the power of your Holy Spirit. Father, as we pray tonight, there may be some who are still on the way. We pray for traveling mercies. We pray for those who aren't able to make it tonight. For whatever reason, we know school's about to start, and there's so much going on in, in lives today that it's it's a little bit difficult to take this time out. But we just pray that you would bless them wherever they may, may be. And we pray for um, Tom and Mary Louise, um, whether they're traveling or they're home. We just pray for a Holy Spirit-type comfort that only you can provide. We thank you for this opportunity. We thank you for this um, location right now. And we pray that you would continue to bless this entire campus um, with whatever's going on now, but more importantly during the day, that you would keep the teachers and the facilitators and the students safe while they're on this campus. Father, we thank you. We praise you for all that you're doing, all that you've done, and all that you will do. And we ask you these things in the mighty and matchless name of our Lord, Savior, our Redeemer. His name is Jesus. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7. I know I said 8 here, but we have to finish what we started last week. And last week we spent a few minutes talking about submission. And Peter takes the submission from um, slavery. He takes the submission from the perspective of employer, employee. He takes the submission from the perspective of government submission, submitting to to government. And um, he gives us all of these um, ideals. And then he takes us home. And last week we talked at length about um, this idea of wives submitting to their own husbands. And we talked at length about it. And we broke down these passages. So I don't want to review it again for sake of time but we did not hit verse 7 and somebody may say well you got six verses talking about um, wives submitting to their husbands and one verse one verse that shares with us the truth about um, husbands so I want to break out some things and I want to give you some things that I find important Um, not that I am a master of this by far, I am not. However, I wanted to share some pointers on some basic rules that a husband and wife should practice. But let's read the verse. Husbands, likewise, dwell with them, your wives, with understanding, giving honor to the wife as to the weaker vessel, And as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers may not be hindered. And that's that's what may trip us up tonight. But let's talk. So he talks about wives. He talks about their this idea of submission. And we we jumped over to Paul's version of this as he writes to the people of Ephesus in the book of Ephesians, he gives us also a picture of the husband and wife relationship and the importance of what we do at home, what we practice at home. We cannot uh, expect blessings from God if we act in public one way and at home not the way God wants us to act. When we come home and we treat our children and treat our wives or our spouses disrespectfully and and because you're behind closed doors and nobody knows, uh, and I've heard about many, many marriages over my lifetime that have lived like that. You you would be surprised. They come to church. They carry the big Bibles. They they dress the part. 
but when it comes down to it, they're, they're living a life of, of a lie. So it's important that Peter wants to focus on this. And then when we get to our lesson, he's going to take us from our home relationship to our church relationship. He really begins to talk about how we treat each other in the body of Christ. and how. So I think it all kind of flows together. But he says, husbands likewise, obviously he starts in verse 1, wives likewise. He's talking about this idea of submission. Submission. Husbands likewise, dwell with your wives with understanding. Um, a good word here would be patience. Not because they're doing something wrong, but just be don't be hot-headed, men. We don't have many men here, but I want to share with you. Don't be hot-headed. Deal with them with understanding. Giving honor to your wife as to the weaker vessel. Now, I want to say, make a, a point here. Because in the eyes of God, women are not weaker than men. Spiritually speaking. Matter of fact, I would argue knowing the women in my life and knowing my life's history and my ministry or wherever I've been, I would argue that women are spiritually stronger in many ways than men are. Um, so when he says here weaker vessel, he's talking about physical ability only. And we obviously know that, you know, obviously there are some women that could kick my butt, but for the most part, women are a weaker, humanly speaking, physically speaking, a weaker vessel. Um, but not in the eyes of God. Definitely not spiritually. As a matter of fact, I would argue the opposite. But here, it's important to see that... <coughs> Peter is talking to the husbands to give them an understanding of their need to be a protector, to be someone who is going to look out for their wives, that this is the call that you have on your, li on your life to be a protector because they are physically a weaker vessel. As being heirs together, and this is where Peter really uh, does, I like what he says here, as being heirs together of the grace of life. That you have a partner, that you are heirs together, not one greater than the other, not one with more value than the other. This is a partnership that should be well maintained and well respected and well um, have you ever seen a fluorescent light bulb explode? Mm -hmm. uh, if you take it out of its thing and, and it has a gas inside, um, don't know how it all works, but I know it has a gas inside that causes the light to, to do that. And the gas, if you were to break that bulb, it would literally explode. It's one of the, the real dangerous things. If you've ever seen one of those things explode, you know what I'm talking about. Well, unity, especially in the body of Christ, is that sensitive. Anything can cause a rift. And, and husbands and wives could get uh, sideswiped. And this is what Peter is trying to make sure that they don't do. And then he ends it with this. And I want to clarify what this means. Because I feel super strongly about the end of this passage. It says, if you do this, in other words, it's great. Because if you don't, your prayers may be hindered. So I'm going to read the, the end of the verse. And being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers may not be hindered. So what is Peter saying to us? What does the Bible teach about that? Well, we understand, we should understand, that if you are operating 
even as believers, now let me finish this thought, because every time I say these things, I get looks, I get daggers, not from this group, you guys love me, and I appreciate that, but I've taught this in the past, and people get really, you could see their hands grab, you know, they, they get really frustrated by what I'm about to say, because I'm here to tell you that if you are not living right, your prayers don't answer, don't pass this room. You, your prayers are hindered. The Bible says that if you go to the altar to pray and you have something against your brother or know that your brother has something against you or your sister, don't waste your time at the altar. Go get it fixed. Because otherwise what you're doing at the altar is useless. And I'm going to say something, but understand the concept here. God does not hear those prayers. Now, you say, well, God hears everything. Yes, but understand, those prayers are not accepted and honored like a prayer of a righteous man before the throne of God. If you're living a life of sin and misery and treating your wife with no respect, the Bible tells me that your prayers are useless. Now, I'm going to say something. I've seen many pastors treat their wives with, without respect. And I wonder... What, 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 what's going on there? They can, they can pastor a church, but they can't lead a family. I've got a problem with that. And I believe that the Bible is saying your prayers will be hindered. So what prayer does, does, does God then honor? What, when do you, when do you open up the line? When do you, when does he begin to hear? When you say, God, forgive me. When you, when you confess your sins. Now, when you talk about confession, people get very Catholic. I'm not talking about confessing to somebody else. We're not required, thankfully, to do that. But we are required. We are required to confess our sins before our Heavenly Father. And the moment you can pray and you pray and you pray and you pray and your prayers don't pass the ceiling and you pray but then you recognize oh I've messed up God forgive me for what I've done okay it then opens up a channel your prayers reach the throne room God now honors your prayers he receives your prayer he listens to what you're saying but let me tell you something, if you go back to behaving the way you were behaving, I believe that not only does he not listen to your prayers moving forward until you ask for forgiveness, he will then bring some, ooh, this is a topic people don't like, like hearing this. He will bring some chastisement. He will bring some punishment. He will make your life uh, a little bit more difficult. I'm glad you guys are here on a Wednesday night because I can't do this on a Sunday. Because people don't want to hear this. This is not Christianity 101 where everything's going to be good and everything's going to be solid. This, is, this is, requires us to live a life with standards. 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. You can't hide from God. I can't hide from God. And if you go home and treat your wife with respect or you're preaching from a pulpit and you go home and you cuss at your wife, I've got a big problem with that. And I wonder how your ministry is being blessed by God if that's the way you're, you're living your life. Because the Bible says to me, you have to do this that your prayers may not be hindered. Because let me let you in on a little secret. God does not hear the prayers of sinful people. Sinners, their prayers go unheard. Now, you say God hears everything. Yes, yes, yes. But they don't reach the throne room. They don't reach its destination. Why? Because unless you repent, and you receive Jesus as your Savior, your access to a holy God is cut off because God cannot face or accept or wink at Are we okay? sin. That's what bothers me about some of these TV preachers that want to tell you everything's going to be okay and they don't talk about sin and they don't talk about repentance. They just say, all you got to do is believe for it and it'll come. Let me tell you something. There's a lot of truth to that, but it comes with responsibility. 
Otherwise, God doesn't listen or hear your prayers. So all these people who say, you know, they, they say let's pray or let's, let's pray before our meal because we always do it, but they're sinners. They're just baiting, you know, heathens. Their prayers don't, don't mean anything. And the only thing that unlocks that block is the prayer of repentance. And it starts with, forgive me. I have sinned. And all, all of a sudden, that lock, that, that, that key unlocks the windows of heaven and your prayers are now released up into a holy throne room. How do we do it? By accepting Jesus Christ. It's only through Jesus that we have access to a holy God. So sinners, you know, you get these these artists, oh, I want to thank God. I want to thank God. He's my Savior. And, you know, their songs are horrific. Their movies are garbage, you know. And they're putting out all this garbage and nudity and all this stuff. And they stand before and they win this award. No, I want to thank God. I, 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 I wish every once in a while that God would respond and said, Listen, lady, I don't know you. Now, please know my heart, but I want to take you to a different level of understanding. You can't go home and beat your wife and then act like everything's okay in the street and think you're, you know, you're a blood-bought child of God because it doesn't go together. It doesn't go together. So my question is, if you live like that, and you do what you want to do, and you don't live a life honoring to God behind closed doors, then the truth is you never were saved to begin with. Because a true believer, a true believer, not a member of the church, not a member of the choir, not a member of the band, or not a person who sings up on the altar, or not a person who collects the offering or not a person who is a deacon. I don't care what their title is in the church. A true believer doesn't live like this. Because a true believer, the moment you do something, see, this is not in my notes, so we're in trouble here. I'm not going to, I have to get through next week's lesson. Get to next week's lesson because I advertised it. A true believer, as soon as they do something wrong, you feel a heaviness. And the spirit, the ministry of the spirit of a holy God, because he is holy and he is residing in the life of a Christian, the moment you, you do something outside of the bounds of our Christian nature, the spirit of God tells you that ain't right. That's not right. You got to fix that. I always use the example if you're on the phone with somebody and it doesn't matter if they're a, you know, uh, somebody, a vendor and you're trying to get some something purchased and, and you, you come off with a little bit of a chippy attitude. You know, we all have the tendency of doing that. And we, we say something a little harsher. We might not have said anything wrong. We might not have cursed, but we, we were just a little harsher than we could have been. And we hang up the phone. If you're anything like me, you automatically feel heavy. Oh, that was wrong. The question is, what do you do next? What do you do next? Because what you should do is pick up the phone again and say, John, Mary, Susan, you, I was just on the phone with you. This is Bob Carabello. I, I was just on the phone with you. I, I want to apologize to you. Oh, for what? I think I was a little harsh. That really wasn't what I wanted to say. or this, That wasn't what I wanted to convey. That's not the way. I, I'm sorry about that. And not, I'm like you can't. I'm, no, you say I'm sorry. People are so, it's so hard for people to say the words. But you got to say I'm sorry. But here, then I'm going to do you another step. Oh boy, I'm, now I'm going from preaching to meddling. Now the next thing is, don't do it again. Don't do it again. Because I'm sorry can only go so far. 
If you keep doing the same thing over and over again, that's when I say God will bring some sort of difficult circumstances. The, the word in Spanish, and you've heard me say this, those who have been studying with me for a while, I'll bring this up anytime this topic comes up. The word in Spanish for punish, to punish someone, is the word castigar. Castigar. Okay, that word comes from the original language, Greek, that reminds us of putting something in a cast. Okay, so punishment oftentimes is God putting us in a cast to stop us from doing that ridiculous behavior. Okay, so you have to understand that sometimes, if you're a parent or a grandparent, you know that sometimes you have to correct or you have to chastise or you have to punish a child just to get them to understand. And we've all said, I know my parents used to say, my mom used to say, this is going to hurt me more than it's going to hurt you, right? You don't understand that. And it's like, I don't understand how that works because this hurts pretty bad. Well, sometimes God has to do that with us. Sometimes God has to shake us or put a cast if the, bro if the bone is broken. He puts a cast so that it can, and sometimes it's not, no, not sometimes. It's usually not very comfortable. Don't get me wrong. Things happen in our lives that, that are outside that control. But I believe that there are many who are going through stuff because of their disobedience. And I say that as my wife is going through this difficult thing. And I wonder, but, you know, we've, we've asked God to, to check us. We've asked God if there was something in our lives that we've done wrong or said wrong or hurt someone and we don't know about it and we did it subconsciously. We ask you, we plead the blood of Jesus and take that out of our lives. So we've gone and confessed, you know, even not knowing. I just, this verse just brings a lot. When I read this, that your prayers may not be hindered. It's something you should if you like to mark your Bibles, if you like to make notes about your Bible, if you like to look at verses, this is not one of those positive go lucky verses, but this is one of those accountability verses that will remind you it is you are required to to be held accountable. I'm going to quickly go through these husband and wife basic rules. One, absolute honesty. Absolute honesty. Which means even if you don't want to share something, you share it anyway. There should be no one or nothing that is kept from your relationship at home with your wife. Absolute honesty. Number two, communication. Talk things out. L release, release the steam. Because if you don't release it, your pipes will bust. And it's never good when your pipes bust. You've heard it said, don't ever go to bed angry. Well, don't stay up three days either. You've got to communicate. Some of those conversations aren't the most pleasant. Some of those conversations aren't comfortable. But if you look back, if you look back over your life, you realize that it's those conversations that build you and made you stronger. Anyway, I can't spend too much time on this. I could do two weeks on this stuff. Number three. So one, absolute honesty. Number two, communication. Number three, overlook minor faults. Stop being so nitpicky. Stop being so judgmental. What's it worth? I, 
I'd add here, pick your battles. Because there are certain things you don't need to be fighting about. Number four, strive for unity in finances. I've counseled many, many husbands and wives who tell me, well, we keep our money separate. Now, if I'm offending anybody in here, I apologize. But I have a strong opinion on this. We keep our money separate. She pays her bills, I pay my bills, and we just, I don't want her to know what I'm doing with my money. She doesn't want me to know what, what she's doing with her money. But yet you share the same bed, you share the same house, you share the same children, you share the same grandchildren, but your money you can't share. I often ask them, so, okay, so how do vacations work? Well, sometimes we split the cost of the hotel and we split the cost of the rent a car. I'm like, oh my word, that's too much. That's just too much. That is just too much. Strive for unity in your finances. Avoid overspending. Because I tell you right now, finances is one of the one of the, the killers of marriage. There are others. I talked last week about being unequally yoked. It was here, right? I think I did that on Wednesday. Uh, I don't remember. All runs together. But being unequally yoked, that's a killer of marriage. Just, you know, two different religions, two different theologies, two different beliefs. Uh, an atheist and somebody who believes in God, oh, no, you don't, you, you know, oh, he's such a nice person. I'm going to change him. I'll make him believe in God. Mm -hmm. Same thing with finances. Avoid overspending. And vo avoid installments. Obviously, you have a mortgage and you have a car payment, but watch out for those credit cards that are 24% interest and you'll never pay them back because you're just paying, you know, $12 a month and you think you got away with something. And then you realize what you spent $1,000 on, you pay $4,000 for at the end of it. A and avoid, see, I'm, I'm getting, and avoid keeping up with the Joneses. Anybody know what that means? Yes. That means you look at somebody else's house, you look at somebody else's cars, you look at somebody else's life, and you want to keep up with them. They bought a new car, I got to get a new car. Honey, I need a new car. I need a new car. I just need it. Why you need a new car? Your car's fine. No, I need a new car. It's because you, you want to keep up with the Joneses. You want to keep up with what everybody else is doing. Forget about the Joneses. Worry about yourself. <laughs> Number five, and then we can go to our lesson. That's my introduction tonight, 30 minutes. Number five, love one another. It keeps you from criticizing or contradicting. Love one another. Love conquers all. If you want to know what love is, 1 Corinthians chapter 13. It'll give you a snapshot. But I tell you, love one another. Um, you're not mad at me, right? Nobody's mad at me. All right, let's jump into today's lesson. First part of the lesson, cultivate love. I'm going to go through this very, very quickly. So for that, I apologize. Cultivate love, verses 8 through 12. Finally, all of you be of one mind. So again, he went from... Um, Submission to master, submission to uh, government. Now he then goes to the home and he says, okay, submit wives to your husbands. Husbands, you got to honor your wives. And now he wants to talk about the blessing of being together. He talks to us uh, in relation to our brother, in our relationship to our Christian brothers. Okay? Or in other words, the church. The church. So he says... Finally, all of you be of one mind, having compassion for one another, love as brothers, be tenderhearted, be courteous, not returning evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, blessing, knowing that you were called to this, that you may inherit a blessing for he who would love life and see good days, let him refrain, from, refrain his tongue from evil. And his lips from speaking deceit. 
Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to the prayers. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. You with me? So, what is Paul? What is Peter telling us? That we must live in unity. Unity. Now, I want to stop and share with you that unity is not uniformity. Unity means we all come from different backgrounds. We all have different lifestyles. We all do different things. But we come together with one common goal. That is to worship the Creator. Unity. Uniformity means we all wear the same things, we all do the same things, we all act the same way. That's uniformity. And the Bible doesn't call for uniformity. A church shouldn't be um, uniformed. We shouldn't operate in uniformity. We, all, we don't think alike. We don't act alike. We don't do things alike. We have to act differently and be ourselves and that's the beauty of unity, where we can be ourselves and come together with one goal in mind. And if the church recognizes that all we need to do is keep our eyes on Jesus, the church will be okay. The church will be okay. So, not uniformity, but unity. Love is the bonding agent. The word compassion here, finally, all of you be of one mind, having compassion for one another. The original word compassion in the Greek means to suffer with. Now, I have often heard and defined compassion as love in action. Love with feet. Love with hands. Love in action. Where you're doing, you don't just say I love you. You show people you love them. But the real meaning of compassion is is to suffer with. If they're going through something, if they're having a hard time, if they're going through a difficult time, all you need to do is show compassion. Sit with them. Be with them. Give them a shoulder to cry on. Sometimes you don't need to say a word. You don't need to say a word. I remember how hurt my wife was. Oh boy. I remember how hurt my wife was when she miscarried our first child. And someone from the church tried to show compassion by saying, oh, I know exactly why you lost the child. Like, okay. So it's just, that's not compassion. Sometimes just sitting there and being quiet. Oftentimes, people try to show compassion by making themselves, putting themselves in the position of the person who's hurting, saying, oh, I know, I went through that. I've gone through that. Oh, yeah, yeah, I, I know how you feel. No, you don't. Even if you went through the exact same thing, you don't know how I feel. I would avoid saying, I know how you feel. I would even avoid saying, I understand. Just say, hey, I'm here. I want to love on you. What do you need? What can I do for you? Don't put, don't, don't insert yourself in it. Because you want to suffer with them and, and let them know you're there for them. Tenderhearted, it says, compassion for one another, love as brothers, love as brothers. And by the way, we all know, sometimes we fight as brothers. Things don't, we don't agree on everything. But one of the things my family knows about me, oh, I'm so sorry, I didn't put my phone on. One of the things my family knows about me, even if we don't always get along, our politics are different, our lives are different, but if my family needs me, I'll be there. Compassion to suffer with. Tender hearted means loving, means having a heart sensitive to the needs of others. 
Again, don't put yourself in the situation. I know exactly what you're going through. I, it happened to me. You know, if you've listened to the news lately, you know we have leaders who tend to do that. Tenderhearted. Having a heart sensitive to the needs of others. And then he says, be courteous. Be courteous. Now you say, wow. This is exactly what I'm talking about, by the way. You say, wow, how does compassionate, love, tenderhearted, courteous. That means you put others first. That means you serve others. That means that you express prompt appreciation for kindness received. You put the desires and the needs and the wishes of someone else before yours. That's courtesy. Courtesy is simple. You're walking out a door, you're, you're together, you say, okay, you, you go first. That's courtesy. And the same applies here because we tend to, to throw courtesy out the window because we know best. No, Peter's saying, be careful be careful, do not overstep. Verse 9 says, not returning evil for evil. In relation to persecution, how do we respond? I'm going to get you back. I'm going to make you pay. You remember what Jesus said? Oh, nobody wants to hear this one. He says, turn the other cheek. So here, Peter's saying, not returning evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, blessing, knowing that you were called to this. That God called you to be in this situation, in this waiting room, in this lobby, in this situation to make sure that God would use you to be a channel of blessing. Why? So that you may inherit a blessing. And then he goes on and he shares some passages of scripture from Psalms that tell us that we are to we are called to live the way God intended. He who would, again, Psalm 34. He who would love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil. If God is blessing you, evil shouldn't proceed out of your mouth. And his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Replace evil with good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayers. You see what that says compared to what the other verse said? That your prayers may not be hindered. How are your prayers not hindered? By living a life of blessing, by being a blessing. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears open to their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Now, I wish I had more time. Because if you compare this to Psalm 34 verse 16, you'll see he left something out. I gotta do it, I gotta do it, because I'm teaching here. I can't, I can't, I can't not do it. Psalm 34. Psalm 34. Psalm 34, verse 16 says, The face of the Lord is against those who do evil, right? To cut off the remembrance of them from the earth. Now, Peter doesn't bring that up. 
I, I guess he didn't want to be as harsh as, as the psalmist was. But he says, The face of the Lord is against those who do evil, to cut off the remembrance of them from the earth. Ooh, if that's not harsh. I wanted to share that with you because he left that out. And that just reminds us of God's grace. God, through the Spirit and through the words and the pen of Peter, he leaves that out, and I think it's important. You with me? If you're with me, say amen. That's old school right there. Next, you want to practice the lordship of Christ. You want to practice the lordship of Christ. Verses 13 through 15 say this, And who is he who will harm you if you become followers of what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you are blessed. And do not be afraid of their threats, nor be troubled. But sanctify the Lord your God in your hearts, and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks for a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. So the answer to verse 13 I'll read it again. And who is he who will harm you if you become followers of what is good? In other words, if you become a believer, who is he who can harm you? The answer is no one. No one. Now you say, wait a second, I don't understand. Yeah, they can harm our physical body. But they can't harm our spiritual inheritance that we have secured with God. And what if you do suffer? Verse 14. God will overrule it for his own glory. Let's watch what it says. Verse 14 says, But even if you should suffer for righteousness sake, for doing good, you are blessed. Even if you should suffer for righteousness sake, you are blessed. Which means God will overrule the suffering. And do not be afraid of their threats, nor be troubled. God uses suffering to bless others, or even to bless the person. Verse 15. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. Isaiah chapter 8 verses 12 and 13 says this. We fear God so little because we fear men so much. Isaiah? Isaiah 8, 12 and 13. We fear God so little because we fear men so much. Here Peter's saying, no, it doesn't work that way. And then he uses a word that many of you may not be familiar with. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. Sanctify means to make him sovereign. To make him Lord. All we do and all we say is his and his will in our lives. That's what it means to sanctify the Lord. His lordship should dominate every aspect of our lives. Everything that we do should be dominated because we have sanctified the Lord in our lives. What does that mean? When we talk about every aspect of our lives, I wrote some things down. Our possessions, home, cars, it all belongs to him. Our occupation, what we do for a living. Our library. Now you say, what? What does that have to do? Well, what you hold dear in your house. I've walked into many people's houses. 
and was shocked to find little Buddha sitting by the front door. <laughs> little fat man sitting by the front door on a pedestal. So when I, I asked the question, I said, hey, what's the deal with the Buddha? Well, he wards off the evil spirits. Nobody comes in or out without him blocking evil spirits. So I have to be, you know, I'm a guest. I, I, I just go home. That's very nice. <laughs> Let's pray. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> your library. Anyway, possessions, occupation, your library, your marriage, your spare time. Nothing can be excluded from this wonderful verse that says, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. And then it says, Always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asked you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. That means you have to live a life. Now you say, oh, is that about talking to people? No, it's not about talking to people. It's about maintaining a good conscience in all that you do. Living a life that is a clear testimony to the glory of God. And then when somebody asks you, how do you do it? You say, it's not me, but it's the hope of glory. It's Jesus in me. It's, it's the relationship I have with the Holy God through Jesus Christ, his son, and the Holy Spirit lives inside of me. Now people say, oh, I don't understand all that stuff. Just know <coughs> that if you see something in me, it's not me. It's the God who lives in me. And that's where we get to this last point. Maintain a good conscience. Because this is what he's saying. So verse 16 says, Having a good conscience. So, so he says, see? He says, verse 15, He says, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Semicolon. Having a good conscience. It's not about talking. It's not about acting. It's about people seeing in you something different. Something distinguishable. Something that they want. And they say to you, how is it that you've accomplished that? How is it that you lost your husband? That you lost your spouse? That you lost a child? That, that you lost a grandchild? That you're in so much pain? That, that all of this is going on around you? How is it that you keep your eyes looking to God? How is it that you trust Him? How is it that you still smile? How is it that you still tell me about your church when you've gone through all of this stuff? That's what it means. Because if somebody asks you for the reason for your hope, for the hope that is in you, I know that I know it doesn't matter what I'm going through, my circumstances aren't going to change the way I act. Having a good conscience. That when they defame you as evildoers, because you know they will, those who revile your good conduct in Christ may be ashamed for it is better if it is the will of God to suffer for doing good than for doing evil maintain a good conscience this is what God is calling us to do this is how God is asking us to live to cultivate love to practice the Lordship of Christ, which means Christ is Lord, and I want to sanctify, verse 15, the Lord God in our hearts. And finally, maintain a good conscience. That's what Peter's calling for us. 
submission in these last two chapters is sort of culminated here, but it really is culminated next week when we see what it means that Christ suffered for us. That he was beaten and spit upon and nailed to a cross. A crown of thorns jammed on his head and stripped naked. And he did all of this. And the first words out of his mouth were, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. So Peter takes us through this journey of submission and ends with what Christ did for us. But as I told you before on Sunday and again at the beginning of this class, these verses, I'm going to read them for you because I read them on Sunday, but I want to read them for you. For Christ also suffered once for our sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, made alive by the Spirit, by whom also he went and preached to the spirits in prison. First controversy. Who formerly were disobedient, when once the divine long-suffering waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is eight souls, were saved through the water. Saved through the water. There is also an antitype which now saves us. Baptism. Not the removal of filth from the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God. Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers having been made perfect and subject to him. And from those verses that I just read to you come three unfortunate uh, religious misnomers, mistakes. One is universal salvation, which means given what Christ did, where he goes into prison. What's prison? We'll talk about it next week. What does he do? So it is believed that between the cross and the resurrection, something happened. If you read the Apostles' Creed, which is a man-made written version, and I grew up in a church where we read it every Sunday till I learned it and I told... I said, we got to stop this. Because you know it says he descended to hell. Okay? So we're going to talk about this next week. I promise you, all the answers will be laid out. You may have more questions than answers, but what happened between the cross, his death, and the resurrection? Peter's describing something that happens where he goes down into the prison where the spirits are, and he preaches to them. So the second misnomer is this idea of a second chance known as purgatory. Which means if someone dies that a loved one because Jesus preached to the dead a loved one can drop kick their loved one into heaven by their prayers. It comes right out of this. Because if he went and preached to the dead, who were the dead? We'll talk about it. And then finally, this idea of water being saved through the water. And now we have an antitype, which is known as baptism. So they have created this idea of baptismal regeneration, which means the waters have salvific properties. And it's the water that saves. Not what Christ did, but the water that saves. Because Peter said that through the water, they were saved. Read it on your own. Google whatever you want to Google. And I will bring you what I believe. An extensive look at just these few verses. It's not a lot of verses. But there's a lot in there that I want to make sure... You walk out of here going, oh, okay. 
Now I got it. Not to say you had, maybe you didn't even read these verses, didn't know these verses existed. I'm telling you three major falsehoods come right out of there. Universal salvation, eh. baptismal regeneration, eh. purgatory, double. Eh. But I want to explain. To, I want to explain to you what the truth is, and I believe this truth can set you free. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time that you've given us, for this opportunity that we have to study your word. And we thank you for this lesson tonight that has given us a clear guideline as to what it is you want from each and every one of us. And for that, we say thank you. Father, we thank you because you've given us the example through Jesus Christ that we are to walk in a solid relationship with you through the work of Jesus Christ. That we are to live with a good conscience. That we are to love, to have compassion, to treat people like our brothers and sisters. Tenderhearted. Not repaying evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but loving because you have shown us by sending your son our savior to die on the cross so painful for you that you turned around and Jesus cried out my God my God why hast thou forsaken me but he was becoming sin for me and Peter goes on to explain it, and we pray that you will fill this room with people who need to hear this message from the pages of your scripture and walk out of here with a clear understanding as to what it is exactly that Jesus did for us. Father, we thank you. We praise you. In Jesus' mighty and matchless name, God's children said, Amen. I promise you, don't miss next week. I never say that, but I promise you, you don't want to miss next week.